This is now the beginning of the rest of his life because the rest of his life is Paris. The rest of his life is, is life in the intellectual center of the world at the time, certainly the most exciting uh, city uh, filled with fascinating people coming through, people from England, people from Italy, everyone. And so now here he is and he moves in to, amazingly, the street named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I mean, isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible that he, in all the whole city, he could find right there the perfect hotel. There it is. It's on uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau right there. There is the location that now becomes the center of his life. Basically, he stays in this location for the whole rest of his Parisian life. Now, he'll be all over. He'll travel. He'll go back to Geneva, go to London. Do, it, it has a lot of travels. But his basic life will unfold here in the neighborhood. What is this neighborhood? Left Bank, uh, Fifth Arrondissement, the heart of the Left Bank. It's the heart of the university world. So all around him on all the streets are, are the different uh, departments of the University of Paris. The Sorbonne is right next door. Uh, the Pantheon is just a block up uh, Rue Saint-Michel, and, and that's where he'll be buried. Both he and Voltaire will be buried in the, in the Pantheon. You can see it on the map. So essentially, this is his world. Notre Dame on the island, just a block or two away. Luxembourg Gardens, just a block or two away. This is his world. Here's the Sorbonne, and here's his hotel that he moves into, the Hotel uh, Saint Quentin and he's going to live here for years and years and years and years. He may leave on a trip and come back, but this place and this life is going to be the center of his Parisian existence for 30 years, uh, on and off. Now, why a hotel? Why would you want to just move into a hotel? Well, it's exactly the kind of life he wanted. He, he, he wanted no responsibilities. He didn't want to worry about a house. He didn't want to worry about mortgage payments. He didn't want to work, worry about any of those banks that were going to fail anyway, so he didn't want a mortgage. And, and, he didn't, and he didn't really imagine getting married and raising a family and, and having a nice house in the city and sending his kids to the school. No, no, none of that. Uh, he thought about Rousseau. <laughs> he thought about Rousseau, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and his books and his ideas uh, and the things he was going to write, and which he will begin doing. And so he moved into the hotel and he will live in the hotel. And he, of course, needed help because uh, he didn't want to cook. So he needs someone to help him eat and cook. And so he found right away a, an employee of the hotel, Maria Therese, uh, who becomes his girlfriend. So, so Maria Therese becomes his girlfriend and his lifelong companion. There's no fooling around from here on in. It's Marie Therese. Uh, and she will uh, hover in the background as sort of a maid for quite a while. He won't even admit to anybody she's anything other than just the maid. Oh, she's the maid. Uh, and she would live as a maid most of the time. So if he had his friends in to a dinner uh, in his rooms, and they would the food would arrive, and Marie Therese would bring him in, and she'd leave. So she never sat down and had dinner with Diderot or the other visiting intellectuals. Uh, and of course, she wouldn't understand understood anything they said anyway, because she wasn't particularly a, a, a book a book learning woman. She was a working, hard working woman, uh, totally loyal to him, and uh, and will take care of him and. And, and this is one tiny little detail that many of the biographers try to leave out of the biography, but it just can't be avoided anymore. Uh, and the mother of his five children. Right. So although he didn't want to get married, and although he didn't want to settle down, and although he didn't want to raise kids in his house with his wife, he did like doing the thing that often creates children. So what to do with all these little kids? Well, a friend said, oh, we have foundling homes here in Paris that are, you know, people take their little bastards there all the time. And so uh, the first little uh, unwanted child is bundled off to the orphanage. And that was pretty easy to do. Maurice, Marie Therese objected. She loved her little baby. She wanted her little baby. 
But her mother, who was on the scene too, and her mother wanted to protect the whole arrangement because Rousseau was the potential earner of the three of them, said, oh, oh, you know, there'll be more, don't worry. So she arranged to grab the little baby and take it off to the orphanage, and she handled all five of them. So her mother, her mother <laughs> was the uh, disposer of the be babies. I know, I know, we're, we're all, it's a funny part of the story because a lot of biographers denied it ever happened for a long, long time. There were French experts wrote fancy articles that said, oh, it never happened, there were no babies, they never had babies. But of course, it couldn't be maintained forever. There were too many letters from too many people. Uh, Marie Therese just had a second baby, Maurice they just had a third baby. And so the babies were uh, uh, carried away off to the foundling home. Now, there is a certain contradiction between the way he treated his little babies and all the books he wrote about how wonderful children are. Because <laughs> he wrote a lot of stuff about how great children were, how wonderful children were, and so, uh, you know, the biographers still struggle with what to do with this unwanted fact. So that's, that's the biographical uh, structure for Rousseau in Paris by 1750. So from the 40s to the 50s, he looks for work. Uh, he meets the fancy literati, the, the dukes and duchesses, and uh, they love him because he's witty and he's smart and he's charming. Uh, he's a musician. He will write an opera that will become a huge sensation in Paris. So he has uh, skills that will endear him to the, to the fancy people of Paris. And through those friendships, he will receive uh, good jobs. One of them is a tutor. He can tutor the children of a duke or a duchess, and he does, and uh, becomes uh, very skillful at uh, writing music and publishing it, and also at a point copying music so that people who, who wanted to own a set of Bach or something would hire him to copy the music. Here's uh, the Pantheon, just up the street. That's where he's buried, with Voltaire. And so now life begins at the Hotel Saint Quentin. One of the things that he does is write plays and an, an opera. And the first big success he has is a play called uh, Narcissus. And I think it's so wonderful because, of course, Narcissus is about self-love. Self and certainly Rousseau knew a lot about self-love. Self and you're going to hear more as we talk about him tonight. Uh, whether he was a narcissist or not, he certainly knew a lot about it. Um, and now he begins working for the encyclopedia. So, so in these years, 1748, 49, 50, 51, uh, the important job he gets is working f with Diderot. Diderot's the editor. Uh, with Diderot and other intellects in Paris writing articles for the encyclopedia. So as you know, that's the way all encyclopedias are written. An editor in New York or Paris or London uh, hands out all these assignments of all these articles and then the uh, person who's going to write it goes out and does research. I had a friend, a good friend, who worked for Encyclopedia Britannica and, and he did it. He lived in New York and he did it all the time and he loved it because it was fun. You just take the subject, go do some research, turn in the article, get paid, go on to the next subject. So that's what he's doing. So, so the, perfect, the perfect setting for our understanding of him at mid-century is as a writer, researcher, laboring on the most perfect enlightenment project of all, the encyclopedia. Then, in 1749, while he's working on the encyclopedia, he sees an ad for a competition. It's in a newspaper. Uh, and the Academy of Arts and Sciences in Dijon, in Burgundy, capital of Burgundy, uh, offers a prize, a very good prize, a very big prize, to uh, the writers of a uh, essay on the arts and sciences. And he sees it, and the challenge that he thinks about is what to tell them about what the arts and sciences have done to civilization. Uh, he tells us all about this moment in his life. It's the definitive moment. It's, it's the great definitive moment 
in the 18th century in terms of the reversal from the encyclopedia and from the world of the encyclopedia and the Enlightenment. So the story is uh, the road to Vincent. Vincent was a, a town, a suburb of Paris. It had a prison and the royal government had sent Diderot to the prison for some passages that he'd written in a, in a book. And uh, Rousseau was writing to the king and the, and the king's girlfriend, uh, Madame Pompadour, pleading for Diderot's release, permission to go in and share his imprisonment. And uh, he had visited Diderot multiple times. He, you would walk from Paris out to Vincent, and then you would uh, then you come back. On one of these journeys, he tells us, and we know all about this because he wrote it all down in a letter, so we have that letter. So on one of these journeys, he carried with him the Mercure de France. This is a, one of the newspapers. He carried it along and he read it as he walked. So he came upon the announcement of the prize offered by the Academy of Dijon for the best essay on has the restoration of sciences and arts, meaning the Enlightenment, contributed to uh, corrupt or purify morals. So had all the work of the Enlightenment improved the morals of the human being, of the human community. So he decided to compete. He was 37, it's time he should make a name for himself, but he did not know much about science or art or history. Uh, so what was he going to do? So he told his friend in his letter later, he had a revelation on the walk. All at once, I felt myself dazzled by a thousand sparkling lights. Crowds of vivid ideas thronged into my mind with a force and confusion that threw me into unspeakable agitation. I felt my head swirling in a giddiness like that of intoxication. A violent palpitation oppressed me. This is typical Rousseau. Everything is like this. Every day he's got palpitations, he's got stars shining, he's got all kinds of wonderful things happening. So, uh, unable to walk for difficulty in breathing, I sank down under one of the trees by the road and passed half an hour there in such a condition of excitement that when I rose, I saw that the front of my waistcoat was all wet with tears. So he'd been there overcome with this revelation, this idea, this thought. Uh, and he looks down and he's been crying. He's sitting there, he's crying. That's him right there. Uh, friend went by and did an eye photo of him, so we've got a little picture of him sitting there. Ah, if ever I could have written a quarter of what I saw and felt under that tree, with what clarity I should have brought out all the contradictions of our social system. With what simplicity I should have demonstrated that man is by nature good and that only our institutions have made him bad. There you are. There is Rousseau on the road to Vincent. The last sentence was to be the theme song of his life. Now he could pour out his heart against all the artificiality, the corruption, the insincerity, the licentiousness, sensuality, snobbishness, and he particularly hated the snobbishness because of course in Paris he was not of the uh, aristocratic class. They all knew it. He was a servant class. He was a he wrote music. He gave tutors. He tutored their kids. So he's always aware that he's not, he's not of that class. Uh, he likes Geneva because when he goes there, he is a Bernard. He does have connections to the upper class. The extravagance of the rich, the exactions of the poor, desiccation of soul by replacing a religion with science. There you have it right there. All of this made him furious. And remember now, all this time, he's working on the encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. So on this trip, if you think about it, he has his foot in two camps. He's, he's, he's back in Paris working on the encyclopedia. He's going to talk to the editor of the encyclopedia, and he conjures up on the walk this new idea. By declaring war on this degeneration, he could vindicate his own simplicity of culture, his village manners, his, uh, his discomfort in society, his disgust with malicious gossip, although he was a great gossip, and his retention of religious faith. Now, one of the things about him that none of us can decide, none of us really know, no expert knows whether he really believes in God or not. He'll bring him out. He'll bring him out when he needs him. And there's lots of places where he wants God, so he brings him out to denounce the secularists. But whether he really 
believed there's no way to know. He certainly never went to a religious service in his whole life. Uh, well, as a kid, maybe they took him, but uh, not when he was a Parisian intellectual. Uh, in his heart, maybe he was a Calvinist, remembering with a kind of a Genevan homesickness, his, his mother, his family, the Bernard family, that's for sure. Uh, but we're not quite sure. But he, it, it did set him apart from the, uh, the fancier intellectuals who were openly atheist like Diderot. Diderot openly was atheist. He arrived at Vincent at the prison. He told Diderot what he wanted to do. Diderot applauded him, said, go forward, stage your attack on civilization. Perfect, great. Hardly any other competitor would dare take that line. And so uh, he'd probably stand out. And so Rousseau went home to Paris, sat down, and began to write his little essay. I composed the discourse uh, and incidentally, these, these kinds of things are called a discourse. So this is the first discourse, and later tonight I'm going to tell you about the second discourse, which is a bigger one, more influential, and so, I'll, so you'll have two. There'll be a first and second discourse. I composed the discourse in a very singular manner. I dedicated to it the hours of the night in which, I, which sleep deserted me. I meditated in bed with my eyes closed, and in my mind I turned over and over again my periods with incredible labor and care. As soon as the discourse was finished, I showed it to Diderot. He was satisfied with the production and pointed out some corrections. I sent it off uh, without mentioning it to anybody except Grimm. Grimm, of course, was another member of the, Encyclo of the Encyclopedia crowd. He was from Germany, but he was a brilliant uh, French linguist and, of course, a great writer. So off the submission went to the Dijon Academy, and guess what? He won! The Dijon Academy crowned his essay with the first prize, gold medal, 300 francs. That was a pretty nice amount of money. Uh, Diderot, with characteristic enthusiasm, arranged for the publication of the discourse without even telling Rousseau because he was connected to all these different publishers and printers. And back came the report, your discourse is taking beyond all imagination, never was there an instance of a like success. It was as if Paris realized that here, at the very midpoint of the Enlightenment, a man had risen to challenge the age of reason. That's exactly right. That's exactly what had happened. This guy, uh, 35, on this walk out to, to a visit of his friend in the prison, thinks this up, knows about the uh, challenge, turns in the essay, which is the opposite of everybody else, of what everybody else was saying, and so he wins the prize. So the essay at first seems to applaud the victories of reason. So in other words, he starts out his essay, and this was smart because he knew he was living in the world of the Enlightenment, the world of the encyclopedia. This is a this is a uh, academy of arts and sciences. So he's submitting this to a lot of fancy intellectuals in Dijon. So it starts out, uh, it is a noble and beautiful spectacle to see man raising himself, so to speak, from nothing by his own exer exertions, dissipating by the light of reason all the thick clouds by which he was by nature enveloped, mounting above himself, soaring in thought, even to the celestial regions, encompassing with giant strides like the sun, the vast extents of universe. And what is still grander and more wonderful, going back into himself, there to study man and get to know his own nature, his duties, his end, all these miracles we have seen renewed within the last few generations. Okay, very good. But a page later, the argument took a distressing turn. All this progress of knowledge had made governments more powerful, crushing individual liberty. There's, there's the key, you see, mid-18th century, the idea that the great clockwork that we've set in motion here has gotten too powerful, all right? Uh, crushing liberty. It has replaced the simple virtues and forthright speech of a ruder age, a simpler age, with hypocrisies of savoir-faire. Sincere friendship, real esteem, perfect confidence are banished from among men. Now, where does he get all that? Well, Le Charmette, in his memory, is pure and wonderful, even though he left the house because there was a little uh, conspiracy going on. Uh, and in Paris, when he gets to Paris, 
It's all lies and hypocrisies. People say one thing to your face and then you find out the next day, oh no, it wasn't true. So sincere friendship, perfect, are banished from among men. Jealousy, suspicion, fear, coldness, reserve, hate, lie constantly concealed under a uniform of deceitful veil of politeness that boasted candor and urbanity for which we are indebted uh, to the light and leading men of this age. So behind everything is lies, hate, gossip, suspicion, let the arts and sciences claim the share they have in this salutary work, this corruption of morals and character by the progress of knowledge and art is almost a law of history. In other words, the arts and sciences of this fancy civilization that we have here in Paris in 1750 is, is merely another example of how a fancy civilization wrecks everything. Let the arts and claim the cor this corruption of morals and character by the progress of knowledge and art is almost a law of history. Egypt became the mother of philosophy and the fine arts. Soon she was conquered. Greece once peopled by heroes, twice vanquished Asia. Letters were then in their infancy. The virtues of Sparta had not been replaced as the Greek ideal by the refinement of Athens, the sophistry of the sophists, the voluptuous forms of Praxiteles. When that civilization reached its height, it was overthrown at a blow by Philip of Macedon and then supinely accepted the yoke of Rome. Rome conquered the whole Mediterranean world when she was a nation of peasants and soldiers, inured to a stoic discipline. But when she relaxed into Epicurean indulgence, praised the obscenities of Ovid, Catullus, and Marshall. She became a theater of vice, a scorn of other nations, an object of derision to the, even the barbarians. So there you go, there's the story. That's what happens to civilizations. All starts nice, farmers work out in the fields just like at Les Charmet, Charmette, they're pure, they're good, and then they get corrupted by power and money. Now, sure, once it was published, various critics arose to defend civilization. His own friend Grimm certainly uh, uh, objected, what devilish nonsense, he said. Uh, what is nature? And Pierre Bale, who was another friend, remarked, there is scarcely a word that is used more vaguely than nature, <laughs> which is true, which is true. But uh, Rousseau carried the day, no, no question. From 1750 on, uh, he, he's the winner. Uh, he is going to just go from this to the next discourse, to more fame, to more uh, books and essays, and more and more success. 